Okay, great. I am live on Facebook. I will introduce you now. Hello, everybody. I'm so excited for this webinar today. I'm so happy to introduce Aparna. Mumbai-based Aparna Pramal Raji is a writer, columnist, public speaker, educator, and the author of the recently released chemical... Um, Kichidi. Yes, thank you. <laughs> How I Hacked My Mental Health, a book on her experiences of living with a serious mental health condition for the last two decades. In her popular monthly column, Head Office, in the Mint newspaper, it looks at the leadership through the lens of workplaces and work styles. Over 100 CEOs have been featured in the Head Office. The column led to her first book, Working Out of the Box, 40 Stories of Leading CEOs. A visiting faculty member at the Anat National University in Ahmedabad, Aparna studied at Oxford University and Harvard Business School. She invites you to connect with her on social media. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for this kind invitation to be here. It's, it's really an honor for me. Um, thank you to everybody who's tuned in from around the world. Um, good, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you are. Um, so I thought I'll share a presentation um, with my thoughts on how one can blend um, medical and spiritual therapies for recovery. Um, so there are some stories of that have that of of my life. Um, I just want to say the first thing was this is actually one of uh, the most interesting presentations for me that I've been made that I've been that I've been making in the last few months since the book's released. A lot of the time I've been having to explain what bipolarity is, but I think all of us either live with it or know something about it or are intimately connected with it. Um, and this presentation allows me to go a little bit deeper. Um, and there are, it, it's relating to very many aspects of our culture here in India. Um, if there are any questions about that, I would love to answer them and um, feel free to post them in the chat box and we can have a Q and A um, as we, uh, after the session, right? Is that's how we're doing it, right? Yes. Okay, great. So I'll just get kickstarted. So um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yeah. So this is my book, Chemical Kichdi. Kichdi means like a mess, like a bit of a soup. Um, so it's referring to the chemical imbalances. It's a playful use of the term. A kichdi also is a kind of a nourishing dish. Um, so something you eat when you're not well also very often. So I guess that's another play on that word and how I hacked my mental health, I, I think we all get. Um, so it was released um, a few months ago and um, luckily it's, it's I'm getting a really good response. Um, mainly it's meant for, I mean, it's been released really in India but it is available in some other parts of the world also on Amazon. So blending medical and spiritual therapies for recovery is what we're going to talk about, as I mentioned. I'll just talk a little bit about me so you have some context. Um, here's a little video, a one-minute video. Some said children were out of the question. Well, here I am, a mother of two boys. Some said I couldn't handle business life. Well, I've interviewed over 100 CEOs and counting. Some said I wouldn't be able to write a book on mental health. Well, here it is, available wherever books are sold. I'm Aparna Piramal Raji, and I'm happy, thriving, and bipolar. I'm here to say that you can live with a mental health condition, even something as serious as bipolar disorder, which takes you very high and very low and learn to thrive with it. Read Chemical Kitchery and find out how I hacked my mental health, and perhaps how you or someone you know can also hack your mental health. Join me in a conversation on a subject that affects all of us. So as you can see, there's still um, a lot of stigma in, in India. I'm sure there is in other parts of the world about what you can and can't do when you have a mental health condition. So that was really one of the intentions uh, for writing this book. It's not that there aren't other memoirs. There have been a lot of, there have been some memoirs in India, but there've been fewer people just talking about it very publicly. Um, and so that's been you know, my intention to sort of utilize whatever platform I've had to get people to talk about the subject and engage with it. So going back to me, this is me, you know, this is 20 years ago when it kind of all started um, just at Harvard. And I think this summarizes my personality uh, of being a little, 
you know, vibrant and warm and optimistic and wearing the yellow sunglasses in a, in a pretty conservative business school. Um, this is me with, with my team after I finished business school and I was running my family's office furniture business. And this is all of us taking part in an exhibition in Germany. We were the first Indian company to, to do these kinds of things of really wanting to innovate and benchmark with the rest of the world. Um, I then shifted to writing partly actually because of, I felt that the stresses of being a CEO were not great for me but also because um, it was, uh, you know, not the right thing for me. I don't think I enjoyed writing as, uh, I, I didn't enjoy running a business as much as I enjoyed writing. Um, so this is a book, my first book that was published seven years ago. It was based on the column that I've been writing in one of India's leading business dailies, which is talks, which where I interview CEOs and I connect um, the spaces that they operate in with the kind of leadership style that they demonstrate, uh, which has also been an, you know, quite an interesting way of looking at business and connecting it with design. Um, this is just a picture of some of my students at the university where I teach. It's always really fun to do that. And then this is me when I'm manic. So uh, this is a picture taken about four years ago, which was the last time when I was manic. With my sister, we were on holiday together, and I think all of us who have lived with this condition can recognize these facial expressions and just how tired we all are. We just don't get enough sleep, but we have so many ideas running through our head. We want to change the world, and we are struggling uh, with, with all of this. And then we have these fantastic allies by our side who are with us on this journey, just like my sister is with me. Um, and then this is a picture when I was really quite depressed uh, about 10 years ago with my children when they were quite young. I think it just highlights for me how, you know, depression is something that is so personal to all of us, where we can be with our families, we can be at work, but we're just really quiet and withdrawn. Um, and how it's so deceptive for the people around us, they don't really know what is going on inside of us. Um, and yet they, they know that something's going on, but they don't really understand the depths of what we're dealing with and, and how we should deal with that. Um, so that this moment also just capture this, this picture just captures that moment for me. And this is one of my favorite ones of me posing by my bookcase, you know, hoping that a fashion magazine will come, just come by and <laughs> shoot me and feature me. Uh, this is just something I got taken for the book launch. Um, and, you know, just, I think, again, captures me like 20 years later uh, in, a, in a really good place. Um, and happy to share that I've been in that place for quite some time. Of course, like all of us, I think there are tremendous ups and downs, even on a daily basis. Um, but I think that the, the real extreme mood swings of mania, even hypomania and depression, um, I haven't had to encounter for over four years now, which, which makes me feel um, a lot more stable. So what exactly has happened? So before I get to the medical therapies and the spiritual therapy in detail, I'll just outline the overall pathway to mental and emotional wellness that has really worked for me, which is what I outline in the book also. As I said, when I started that I really wanted the book to be a, a roadmap or a guide or a template for other people. It's just not a memoir or my story. So I've come up with this framework of seven therapies that have helped me and I, I hope could also help other people. They're all drawn from everyday life. So we'll just start with that. So the first one really, I think we all recognize that medical therapies are the starting point for treatment and for recovery. Um, so whether it's medication or talk therapy, it took me over a decade to start medication for a long set of reasons, because I think we come from a culture which is quite skeptical of medication. Um, also, I was worried about the impact on having, on having uh, about getting pregnant and having children. So we, we actually stayed away from medication until it became an absolute necessity. And I was actually psychotic and I needed something to tranquilize me. So, but now I've been taking meds regularly uh, for the last uh, nearly 10 years. And um, I think I've been doing much better because of that. Um, talk therapy also, I've had a series of therapists over the last 20 years, um, some based in India, some based in the UK. And I continue to think of this as a very vital element of 
my ongoing recovery as well as my ongoing ongoing sort of peace of mind. Um, love therapy is what I call the role of the caregivers or the immediate friends and uh, immediate caregivers and family members, usually family, family members. And I really like to think of this idea that mental health is a team sport. I think all of us who have been in this situation recognize that, that it is something that it really needs, um, a, you know, if, 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 if it takes a child, if it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a community to heal a mind. Um, and the team needs each other. And also what I'm trying to say through this is that I'm also on someone else's team. Even though there are people looking after me, I am the primary caregiver of my family. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I am giving as much as I am receiving. So I think it's just a sense that we, you know, we all need to kind of give and receive at the same time and maybe ask ourselves whose team are we on and who is on our team. So just a fun picture of all of us at Christmas last year. Um, a few members of my extended family, including my children and my husband and my parents uh, and my in-laws and other people. The other part that's been really important for me have been allies and the therapy of empathy. So, you know, I think um, we often think of caregivers and, and the role that they play, uh, and we acknowledge that. Um, but it's, for, for me, it's been really important to have allies um, in the form of mentors, friends and networks um, that have really been in a position to help me through this, what I call the therapy of empathy. And in a way, family members, I don't think have that luxury because they have to often just fix the situation, you know, and they, they don't have the, the they're, not, they're not actually in that position necessarily of being empathetic in quite the same way. Whereas somebody who's a little bit outside the family can play that role really well. And uh, all of these three groups of people, my mentors, friends, networks, have really done that. Um, I'll just share a couple of examples. These are what I call my daily download friends. These are on my birthday, and this is a, a group of them. You know, I mean, I'm in touch with these ladies almost every day, every few days. We're really in sync with each other. And I think that, you know, we're now in a situation in life where if you wanted somebody at two in the morning, you know, you would be able to rally a few friends without a problem in an emergency. But who are the friends you're actually in touch with on a daily basis? And they're actually in sync with you. They know when you're traveling. They know what's happening in your life. Um, you can share with, you know, your, your daily, daily ups and downs with them. They are really my emotional barometer. And I am that for them, too. So it's really um, an important aspect of my well-being being to, to have people like this in my life. Um, another example is my book club, which is the group that actually supported me in writing this book, um, because earlier there was, I was a bit, I, was, I wasn't sure whether I could do it, whether I had the distance from my emotions, whether my family would let me, whether I'd be comfortable talking about my condition in public. There were so many questions and I was on this journey for many years actually, but they have really supported me by reading drafts. So having these spaces where, you know, these just these really safe spaces where you can share your dreams and hopes is, is so important. Work therapy was a game changer for me because once I could tell my colleagues and my bosses about it, I became a lot more comfortable about my condition, um, which is quite unusual, I think, especially in places like India, where people are really worried about their job prospects if they share their mental health conditions at work. It may be different from other parts of the world, and I'd be delighted to hear that, but it, it's quite diff different here. So this, but this was a very positive game changer for me. And self-therapy is really the conversations with the self. So you know, I think that's probably one of the most important things that happened is that I started journaling about 10 years ago and I tried to apply a sense of rigor and empathy to what I was doing. Um, and, you know, just being kind to myself also, but also being rigorous with myself and being uh, not just letting my emotions out, but analyzing them and think, taking a step back and acknowledging what was really going on. Um, and I'll share an entry from 10 years ago where my family had just sold the family, the business that I was previously running, partly because my mother wasn't very keen on running it herself and she didn't really feel that this was something that I was best suited for. So I wrote that I, I still need to find a way of turning my intellectual interests 
writing film or design into something that is of value and will also fulfill my needs of winning peer respect. This is exciting because there are several options and the road is open, but terrifying because of the uncertainty. So I just think it indicates that I was, you know, quite willing to talk about how terrifying it was for me and use a word that's as strong as that to just acknowledge those emotions um, and not be judgmental of myself um, and acknowledge my needs that I needed pure respect at that point in time. And when I go back and look at this 10 years later, so much has changed, right? I, I don't necessarily need all the validation that I did at that point, but I think that process of writing it down and reflecting has been really, really important for me. Spiritual therapy, we're gonna talk about in a minute. So I won't say much about that. Um, lifestyle therapy, I think we all understand um, as anyone living um, with this condition that how important sleep is, how important exercise is, how important nutrition is, how important play is. And just, you know, a friend got me to see that, think of it not as a jail sentence or a life sentence that we're all leading with, but think of it as a garden that you need to attend to every day. And, you know, whether you're doing a yoga class or whether you're making sure you get enough sleep, but you're actually thinking of it as a garden that you're looking after every day. So this is me in the lockdown, just trying to exercise even during the lockdown with my trainer. And this is how I relax with the swing and the music and a pair of headsets, no matter how hot it is, but I'm there with my uh, kimono. <laughs> So these therapies keep me stable, peaceful, and joyful. And now coming to how I look at the intersection of medical and spiritual therapies. So this is the way I look at the balance that um, drug therapy really manages my symptoms and imbalances. Um, it's the starting point. Um, and it's, it's one of the, the, the biggest aspects of, you know, being, st being stable and recovering and maintaining equilibrium. Talk therapy has really helped me to identify my triggers. Um, it has also uh, helped me to address some of them, but really it has been the spiritual therapy, which has really showed me and given me a pathway on how to address my triggers. Um, I think Anybody who's looking at this might feel that the talk therapy is, uh, is supposed to sort of help you to address your triggers also. Um, and I'm not denying that it does, but I've just found that uh, a deeper solution has sort of lies in the spiritual therapy. And I'll, I'll share three examples with you. Uh, first, I'll describe what I mean by spiritual therapy, in, in my case, at least. Um, so I would first like to say that I'm actually not perhaps a very religious person in the sense that I, I don't um, go to, you know, religious institutes like temples or I don't mind going to them, but I, it's not a habit for me. Um, the ritual aspect of religion in terms of the, the, the prayer part of it or, you know, the worship part of it is not something that I tend to do very often. But what I have done over a period of time is I've listened to a lot of discourses by gurus um, mostly they are Hindu and Buddhist. Um, although I would say that one of the favorite uh, hymns that um, one of my most favorite hymns is, in a, is a Christian hymn called Amazing Grace, which I'm sure a lot of people know. Um, and that's been a huge source of solace for me or inspiration for me. So, but uh, I've, I've gone to a lot of these discourses and usually in person in India, you can find them. You know, if you look for them, you'll find them. Um, I've studied some ancient texts with the help of these gurus. Um, I don't meditate really because my psychiatrist advised me not to, but I think uh, I have like a really seven hour long, I think it is spiritual playlist. Um, so I, I, I think of that as meditation through music. Um, I've stopped and started and restarted, but I think now I've started for, for, for a long time yoga. So for, for me, I look at that not just as a physical practice, but something that has a spiritual side to it. And definitely chanting is something I turn to when, especially when I can't sleep or when I need to in times of stress, then that is something that really helps me. So 
it is only it, it's only really been motivated by an interest in the subject it was never really motivated by saying i want to understand my mental health condition better um one of the things i want to say was all of these therapies that i just described were actually parallel journeys so they were all things happening at the same time it's when i sat down to write the book that i realized that all of these different aspects of healing were happening at the same time so spiritual therapy was really motivated by curiosity um and not necessarily saying looking at it as a solution to 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 some of the challenges that i was going through mentally or emotionally or psychologically um the books there are two books in particular that have really influenced me um one is called the bhagavad gita which is um a hindu text um it's probably considered like the you know the the one, the most sacred of hindu texts um there's a fantastic there has many translations the translation makes all the difference um this is one translation that i thought was really good but you know to understand these texts it's really helpful to have explanations um you it's very difficult to read these texts without the explanations because there's so much nuance to it um and nowadays there's so much available over the internet if somebody is interested um i watched a lot of videos also um and uh, they they're very they you know uh, they they're very interesting um the holocaust of attachments maybe kind of a controversial sounding title but um this is a book all about this whole idea of attachment we're going to talk to in a minute but literally there was a group of us around 10 or 15 of us who studied this one book for a year so this is you know this book is only like 200 or 300 pages long but we spent an entire year with a teacher who taught us this book and explained it to us um and i think has this has been very very important to me in in my journey so let's start so the first one is finding a framework into mindfulness so i think a lot of us um understand the notion of mindfulness i think anybody who lives with a lot of emotion has probably been told at some point in their life to think about mindfulness um and you know if you have a definition of mindfulness you know it would the whole idea would be of observing the emotion and not becoming them not being consumed by them having an ability to step back from the emotion um and that's what you know that's the theory that we have all been told at some point um another way one of my first um uh, ther therapists who was who was actually a big influence of my of my journey into spirituality uh, her, her name was radhika shet um she also got me to think about making friends with one's emotions so that you're not actually you know in a state where you're just antagonistic with them even if they are things like anger and you know frustration and fear um that we're still in a in a situation where we make friends with emotions um but how do you get there right like what is it that gets you to that position where you can be mindful um so the framework that i discovered through um my lessons with my gurus was um this whole idea of body mind and intellect um to say that look when we're composed uh, of um ourselves as as personalities there is a physical personality which is the body and there is the mind and then there is the intellect and the mind is much more indiscriminate impulsive and taking decisions that are you know based on whims and fancies and the intellect is the seat of reason and rationality um and it's and and it's able to kind of be a lot more discriminate about the decision making that's happening and so we can make choices with our mind or we can make choices with our intellect um now we often when we think of ourselves we think only of the mind like we think the our mind is 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 sort of the main driver but to have this distinction of mind and intellect um uh, was i found really helpful way for me to think of there are you know emotions that are driving my decision making and then there is reason that is driving my decision making um so i'll share an example um uh this is in my diary for about 5 years ago that my uh doctor at the time wasn't very keen that i do some writing and he had a actually went to see him and he was incredibly patronizing and he said that 
you should be, you know, you're, you're, you've, you've done a little bit of writing on mental health, but you should just stick to what you've been doing in business and you're good at planning the children's summer holidays. So you should spend your time doing that. And your husband has a very busy schedule. And it was, it was really quite disheartening and it made me very unhappy. Um, and when I went to my husband and told him that, he was actually sort of himself feeling very vulnerable. And he said, you know, I need this doctor because he is who I turn to when, when you are manic. Um, and literally at that moment, I went into the bathroom, I burst into tears. And then I just sort of, got, you know, collected myself. And I went back onto the sofa and sat in the living room. And my husband said, okay, you know, our son's birthday is coming up. Let's not have a fight until then. I said, we're not even having a fight now, you know? And, and I felt later on very happy that I could kind of con contain those emotions and just take that step back and write that there were follow-up conversations. And you'd be happy to know that we did change the doctor eventually. So I think, and the book has come out. So there is you know, a, a story there, but it's just a story of, you know, how do we actually manage our emotions um, at, at that, in that moment and prevent an escalation and prevent something from turning into a situation. Um, and so I think this, this framework of body, mind and intellect is something that I rely on a lot when, when my emotions are, um, tend to overtake me, which, which happens, you know, a lot. This one is um, probably um, the one that might require the most explanation. So I think we have heard of the word dharm um, in some context. Uh, I think it means a lot of different things. Uh, to many people in India, it would suggest the idea of duty, that um, we you have a duty to you know, look after your children, you have a duty to look after your parents, you have a duty to be uh, a good citizen or whatever it is. So we, we all play these roles and the, the, the dharm in, suggests duty. But I explored this a little bit further and I came across a, a different definition. Um, there are several, there are maybe 20 definitions of dharm, um, but one of them is really the idea of the, your essential nature. So one of the biggest triggers for me in my manic episodes was that I grew up with a certain conception of what I was meant to do in life. In a sense, I grew up with my conception of what my dharm, my identity, my purpose was. I was born into a business family. I went to a business school. I would, so I was destined to come back and to be in my family business and eventually become the CEO. And that was really my identity. And that was how I thought of myself for the first 30 odd years of my life or maybe more. And then when eventually I had to, I had these manic episodes and the stress of the business was getting to me, it became pretty clear that it would not be possible for me to continue in that role. And I had to really explore that, get onto a different journey to understand what I should be doing as you saw in the, uh, journal entry that I wrote earlier. And I remember being uh, with my yoga teacher who was, um, was from a branch of yoga, which is also very spiritually inclined, which is the Bihar school of yoga. And I was explaining this problem to her saying that I have, you know, this, this identity issue has become like a crisis situation for me and is kind of turning into a trigger for, you know, my mood swings. And she just recited this one verse from the same book, the Bhagavad Gita that I showed you, uh, saying better is one's dharm, even if imperfect, than another's dharm followed perfectly. Better is death in following one's own dharm, for another's dharm brings danger. And she did not explain it to me. She did not say anything. She just gave me the verse. And she left it for me to understand what that meant. Um, and I and I really started searching, right? I went to course. I said, "What is dharma? Is it truth? Is it duty? What should I be doing um, with myself?" And eventually, she gave me an answer when I was writing the book, and we discussed it. And she said, "Dharma is like your essential nature. 
I think we we use the word ikigai. We understand that maybe that's a you know close sub close proxy for it, but it's it's your essential nature, just like wetness is the essential nature of liquid or water. You know, it's something that the water cannot exist without. That is what the water is meant to do. It's to be wet. Um, the thing about it is that it can be elusive because it can change. As you change over a period of time, it can change. And there are so many definitions, as I just said, you know, we are all parents, we are all colleagues, we are co-workers, and we, we play all these different roles. So this was for me a really important self-interrogation of what it is that I wanted to do. Um, and if there's one other book that really um, complemented this, this, this search, it was it's a book by another business school professor, um, How Will I Measure My Life by Clayton Christensen. And I think it, it complemented this journey really well. And I think I'd reached the place where I said that, you know, I will find joy in the writing that I do, in the teaching that I do, in the speaking that I do, in being able to impact other people through the work that I do and, and make a difference and, and make a difference in, in the way that I want to. So I, I think that um, what happened was that this, uh, this allowed me to interrogate myself in a way that was really deep. And then the third part was understanding the levitational power of detachment. Um, now we think of attachment um, as sometimes a very good thing that if you are attached to your child, if you are attached to your partner, if your partner is attached to you, um, then these are all good signs. And we use that word in, in a positive way. The attachments are, you know, a good thing very often. Um, I'm not sure what the psychological definition of attachment is, but I think in colloquially, when we use attachment, we say, you know, think of it as good thing. And we think of detachment as being indifference. So we, we think of detachment as saying, oh, they're so detached is that person is really indifferent. But really what I've, what was the core of the book that we studied, the uh, Holocaust of attachment was to think of attachment as almost something that's a sort of emotional bondage. That's something that is really, you know, preventing you, that is, that is ultimately not good for you and is a cause of suffering rather than something that is liberating. And detachment being something that actually can liberate. And let me just give you an example to, to explain that. Um, so there's somebody in my life who's, who's very, you know, very close, all, almost like a member of the family. And that person really let me down in over um, multiple times um, at a personal level, at a financial level, at an emotional level. They just weren't there for me, even though they were a very close member of my life and an integral part of my life. Now, they were all, that relationship was also causing me a lot of mood swings. It was leading to, you know, uh, triggers and manic episodes. And then I realized that essentially that other person is not getting affected. It's just me who's getting affected. It is my attachment to that other person that is causing me the pain and misery and suffering that I'm going through. And then I'm inflicting on other people, the people who do love me around me. So of course, any person would you know, recognize that and take a step back and say, fine, try and cut yourself off from that person. And that is, Yes, that, that that is a you know natural reaction but the beauty of detachment is to say you can still be fond of that person but don't have the expectations because your feelings may not change you may still be fond of that person but you're not going to have the expectations that they're going to come through for you in in quite the same way when it comes to love i think the most beautiful definition of attachment and detachment that i've seen is that if you love someone and you want them to do something for you, that is attachment. You are really, love means I'm doing something, you know, that person is doing something for you, that is attachment. But if you are doing something for the other person, that is detachment. That's the way I look at it. Not just me, but that is what the, you know, spiritual gurus think of it. And, and, um, and then they have this whole other thing on romance, which I'm not going to get into because that's far too complicated. So, uh, but yes, so that's really the beauty of detachment. 
Um, I wrote a poem about this, which I'll just read. So it's called Snow, and it was written the first time um, I took my kids skiing in Switzerland. And although I've seen snowfall before, but this was really a winter wonderland. It was beautiful. It was Switzerland, and I was so manic, <laughs> and they were, you know, just trying to learn how to ski. Um, so I saw the snow, and I wrote this: that for some it's a slope, for others it's powder. For some, it's seasonal dressing. For me, it's vairagya. Vairagya is the Hindu word for detachment. The beauty of detachment. Would the tree be so precious without its silver? Yes, it comes and goes, but it is eternal. Nature's silver lining playbook. Yet I am lost in its power. I cannot find the simple root home. As I stare at the white forest, one day I will get there. I pray to the sun who melts this snow. That is Vairagya. So I'll just explain it. So, you know, the, the slope and the, the, the powder, I mean, the slope we understand is the ski slope, but also the slippery slope of life. And the powder is, of course, the, the, the ski, the, the powder and the slope itself, but powder refers to like cocaine also. And just how something that is so beautiful can, can also be so dangerous, right? And the idea of the silver lining playbook is the film I think we all might be familiar with about bipolar. And the idea is that I'm so attracted to the silver because it's so beautiful and it's a bit like mania because it's so dangerous. I mean, skiing is dangerous and it, it's so beautiful. It's seasonal, it comes and it goes. It's amazing, it's attractive. So the only way out is you have to pray to the sun because the sun is gonna melt that snow. And so what your object of your desire should then be is more the sun, which is the thing that will take away the thing that you actually are attached to. So that, that was how I looked at this. Um, and I think that this whole idea of attachment and detachment has really helped me to think of relationships, work, um, you know, ego, and so many other aspects. Which, which I don't think could have happened so quite so easily in a, in a therapy session. So in a way, this is what I'm saying, is that talk therapy shows me the triggers for my mood swings, but it is spiritual therapy that stops me from loading my gun in the first place. That's saying that, you know, why is your gun loaded? Can you, you don't have to, not just, not, it's not enough just to stop pressing the trigger. It's about saying, don't load the gun. So that's it. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Um, I just had an outpour of people just thanking you for sharing your journey as well as showing your spiritual practices. Um, I did want to share some of the questions that came in through email. Um, someone was wondering, how long did it take for you to find your spiritual routine? I would love to incorporate something like you did into my journey of healing. Yeah, I mean, it I think it's just been an organic journey over many years, but um, I think it probably happened more seriously after in, in the last 10 years where I just really um, kind of accepted that I had a situation that I needed to deal with um, and that uh, I needed to, you know, probably in, understand myself a little bit better. So I, I took it more seriously then. But yeah, I mean, if you want to find it like, I think um, I can share the, the, the one of the classes that I took, they have an e-learning um, module, which is available. There are lectures that you can attend online at your own pace if you want to, that's, that's one option. But I think that there's so many books out there and so many kind of courses and things that you could do now that there's so, there are many options available. It's just a question of wanting to start the journey. Right, thank you. and. Someone is wondering, how can I find a therapist that is accepting of my culture? Is there certain questions that you have asked your therapist or doctor? How did you find the right fit for you? I think a therapist should be um, just, you should have a sense of comfort about them, you know? Um, and uh, I, I think it's the way I look at it is perhaps not so much based on culture, but just in terms of, do they understand where you're coming from? Do they understand, are they open to that background? Do you find a sense of connect? Um, and I think it's important to keep trying until you find the right one. 
the other thing is also you evolve as a person, right? So I've literally, I've had three therapists over the last 20 years and they've all been tremendously useful at, at each point in time because I needed different things. Um, so I think it's okay to recognize that you evolve and it's, it's, it's okay to find, you know, different people who could help you. And another question was, hi, Aparna, thank you so much for sharing so authentically. Your story is a massive inspiration to me. Could you please elaborate on why your psychiatrist did not advise meditation? Yeah, so um, at that point, they felt that, um, you know, if you're depressed, meditation can make things worse. Um, also, I, I had been in a yoga ashram and I had a psychotic episode there. I think I was in a pretty bad state before I went there. So it just it, it kind of just got a little worse. Um, uh, I mean, not to not to blame the yoga or the ashram or anything like that, but I'm just saying that sometimes there are unintended consequences of doing these practices because they can be very powerful. I do also want to caution that there have been times when, um, you know, I can go overboard on the spirituality and, you know, you, you think that you're literally, you're having this moment when you're communing with the sun or whatever it is. So I think, I think that it, it can't get to a stage where it's too, um, it's excessive, you know, you like anything and it needs to be kept in moderation. Perfect. And someone also asked, I am also in India. How can I educate my family about bipolar disorder? They have never heard of it. Well, I honestly feel they should buy my book because I've had people writing to me, telling me, and then I, I'm very happy to communicate with you. You can reach me on social media um uh and we can have a conversation but like i've had people writing to me with exactly the same situation that they are going through something and their family doesn't really understand it but and now their entire family has read the book and it's made things a lot easier for them so um i i, I think it's easily available there yes and i will also be sending out your book in our latest newsletter as well where you can directly buy the book if anyone is interested and i can always email the link as well um, one more question. Someone asked, as a healthcare worker, how can I support a patient's journey that is a different culture than me? Do you have advice on, on potentially educating my teammates? Well, what I would love to know what aspects of their culture, you know, they, they would need to, but I think you should have maybe someone come in who's more representative of that culture to talk to them and to, to, to talk about you know, let's say if you took each of these seven therapies, right, they're, they're pretty kind of standard things that would affect all aspects of life. Maybe they could talk about what work life, what, what family life means in this culture, what success means in this culture, you know, what, what are the, some of the sort of, how does, how do relationships play out in this culture? So maybe they could get somebody who's like a little bit of an expert in that field to come and talk to, to talk to their team about that. Thank you. Okay, that wraps, that wraps up our questions today. Thank you everyone for joining, joining us. We hope you gained value, valuable information today. And thank you so much for, for Aparna for joining us, sharing your insights and your story. We are so grateful for you. If you enjoyed our webinar today, please, please let us know in, your, in our comments and please check out our other videos on our YouTube channel where this will also be uploaded. Thank you everyone. And we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation and for all the great questions. Thank you so much. Thank you.